Welcome to another episode of Threat Posts Now, Threat Posts video interview series. I'm Lindsay O'Donnell Welch, Senior Editor with Threat Post, and I have the pleasure of being joined today by Patrick Wordle, the Principal Security Researcher at Jamf. Patrick, thanks so much for coming onto the show today. Thanks, Lindsay. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, definitely excited to talk nerdy about macOS security trends in uh, 2020 and beyond. Yes, and there's a lot to uncover there, I feel like. Um, Definitely. So just for our viewers, for those of you who don't know Patrick, he's an expert in all things macOS security related, um, whether it's Apple Zero Days or analyzing macOS malware. Um, so Patrick, I kind of wanted to do a year in review deep dive into macOS for 2020 going into 2021. Um, so just to start, can you tell us a little bit about the biggest macOS trends that you're seeing this year, either on the vulnerability side in terms of any big security threats that really turned your head, um, or on the cyber criminal side, what you're seeing there? Uh, yeah, sure, Lindsay. That's, that's a great question. It's definitely nice to kind of look back retrospectively at the end of the year. Uh, so one kind of area that was interesting to me are uh, large security vulnerabilities on the iOS platform that actually also impacted macOS as well. So kind of off the top of my head, uh, the T2 vulnerability, if you're familiar with iOS, the check rain exploit, uh, that actually impacted Mac computers as well. And that was kind of interesting because that only kind of came out secondarily, but the fact that an attacker with physical access could gain access to this low-level T2 chip and then do all sorts of shenanigans on, on MacBooks um, and Mac systems, I think, was was a really big story. Um, another instance, really nice iOS vulnerability that Ian Beer found also impacted Mac OS. We're seeing a lot of uh, really powerful bugs found predominantly on the iOS platform. A bit more interest, more research going on there. But because of the shared code base, a lot of times it impacts uh, Mac OS as well. So that was one interesting story. Another kind of interesting avenue, especially in terms of vulnerabilities and malware, looking back, is attackers leveraging legitimate functionality or abusing Apple technologies in nefarious manners. Uh, so for example, we had a scenario where uh, an iOS application, TuTalk, not to be confused with TikTok, uh, TuTalk had been submitted to the Mac, uh, sorry, the iOS app store, turned out to be a, um, a utility designed by a foreign government to, to spy on its citizens. Um, on the Mac side, we also saw adversaries notarizing their adware, their malware, basically getting Apple's stamp of approval. So that was kind of an interesting trend to see attackers leveraging trusted Apple mechanisms, the iOS app store, notarization services to in order to get their, uh, their malware onto end user systems. Right. And I feel like that's just kind of a trend in mobile security that we're seeing in general, too. Um, but just kind of focusing in on that, um, the cyber criminal aspect of things, who are some of the biggest players in the um, you know cybercrime world right now when it comes to Mac malware? And what EPTs are you seeing that are really doing a lot of damage out there or really kind of um, updating their TTPs, um, really, sure. um, you know, really trying to um, update their malware um, that you're seeing in 2020? Yeah, so there's two main categories. You kind of have cyber criminals, and then you kind of have more nation state adversaries. So on the mm -hmm. cyber criminal side, we really see adware continuing continuing to proliferate, uh, target mm -hmm. macOS systems uh, just indiscriminately. And this is because I think there's so much money to be made off adware that the adware authors are incredibly motivated, and, th and thus we're seeing a lot of innovation from a kind of a you know, uh, an offensive uh, point of view, where, for example, they are finding ways around Apple notarization services or finding very creative ways to infect user systems. So mm -hmm. uh, that's one large trend, and I would say one cyber criminal uh, area where we're really seeing. On the other side, we have the more sophisticated APT groups that are usually going after individual targets or certain companies or networks, right? They're not as indiscriminate. Uh, the most well known is probably the Lazarus group, which is normally attributed to. The North Koreans, they are very prolific in the macOS space. So, uh, you know, we're seeing a lot of new tools and techniques coming out from them. Uh, we're seeing them continually to continue to evolve their capabilities on macOS. For example, we're seeing them use in memory payloads. Uh, we're also seeing them take Windows malware and port that to macOS. 
So that definitely shows a continued interest uh, in the macOS system from the APT groups. Uh, now, I will caveat there are clearly other APT groups that maybe we just don't see or know about. Um, you know, unfortunately, there's always some, uh, I would say, known unknowns. Uh, so, you know, that's something I always want to caveat. But uh, I would say Lazarus Group is probably the most visible in terms of Mac-focused APT groups. Right, right, definitely. Um, well, on a more positive note, uh, you previously mentioned early on uh, in the beginning of this year that Apple was, you know, overall moving in a positive direction from a security point of view um, in terms of the fact that they continually add malware mitigation and security yep. features um, that are um, based on or built into the, the OS. Um, has this continued throughout the year, both from a security and privacy perspective? What are you seeing there? Yeah, so I do sometimes criticize Apple for their missteps, but I really also should give them a lot of kudos for really moving in a positive uh, direction. They have an incredible security team. They have, uh, you know, really a group of, of top-notch researchers that I think are really driving the platform in a really positive point of view from a security security point of view. Uh, some examples, you know, Big Sur coming out, I think there's a lot of built-in security features. Uh, for example, the notarization, which basically means that software has to be approved by Apple before it's run. Mm -hmm. And yes, there are ways to perhaps sidestep that or get Apple to approve that. But overall, it's a really good step in the right direction and should uh, really thwart the majority of social engineering attacks where, you know, for example, adware tries to trick users to infect themselves. So that's really great to see. Um, we also see with the introduction of Apple Silicon based hardware, uh, you know, these have custom Apple chips and that provides a lot of security pretty much at the hardware level. So we talked about the T2 vulnerability. That's something that's kind of in the past now with these new hardware. So we really see Apple both elevating the security in their hardware and their software. So again, kudos to Apple for continually uh, moving in positive direction and definitely raising the bar in terms of being able to hack and persist on uh, their, their systems, on their software and hardware. Right, right. And I know, too, from a privacy perspective, they've done a couple of different uh, things there, too. I know um, they had some new, um, you know, I guess, uh, restrictions for iOS and macOS developers that where they're required to provide more detailed information about how their apps collect info and what data they collect and what it'll be used for. Um, so that's an interesting one, too, just from a privacy perspective. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point, Lindsay. And I think Apple is truly a privacy-centric company. Um, I really look at the business model, right? They make a lot of money off selling you expensive hardware and using other their services. So that means they don't have to monitor what you're doing. Other big tech companies give you everything for free, and they have to recoup costs some way, which they do in advertising. Uh, so from Apple's point of view and from a user's point of view, Apple can really take a very privacy-focused approach, both in their browsers, for example, Safari, and in their operating systems, for example, you know, requiring application developers, exactly like you said, to um, you know, request permissions before accessing the user's location, certain files. So honestly, if you care about privacy, you should probably be using uh, Apple products versus you know, maybe some of the other competitors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm sure a lot more uh, you know, mobile users care about privacy these days. So <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, speaking of Big Sur, um, you know, there was an issue earlier in November where it was discovered that an Apple feature in the latest Big Sur release of macOS could allow some Apple apps to bypass content filters and VPNs. Yep. And I know that you uh, kind of had some thoughts on this when it initially came out. Um, can you kind of explain the situation and, and what happened there? Yeah, definitely. So as part of the push to building a more secure operating system, Apple deprecated something called uh, Kex or kernel extensions that were traditionally leveraged by software utilities or software tools such as the firewalls in order to filter network traffic to, you know, block, for example, unauthorized traffic. So with the deprecation of that, Apple provided something called the network extension framework, um, and it allows firewalls to, again, filter traffic. Uh, in a way that doesn't run in the curve. So it provides more security and stability, which is actually a really good thing. The problem was that Apple exempted a large portion of its system daemons and applications from being filtered through this new network uh, extension framework. So this meant if a firewall used this new extension, which Apple is suggesting firewall products do, uh, a large percentage of traffic 
uh, originating within the operating system, like I said, wouldn't be routed through, meaning it would be able to directly connect to the internet. Uh, this is problematic because I found several trivial ways to coerce these exempted applications or daemons to generate network traffic on my behalf. So what malware could do is once on a system, similarly abuse this, for example, to exfiltrate traffic. Uh, since this traffic wouldn't be routed through any of these firewall products, it's a very trivial way to circumvent uh, this extra, lo extra level of protection. Now, Apple did this for a usability point of view, but I really don't think they thought through the security implications as well. Um, good news is the security team has seemed to be very responsive once we illustrated these attacks. Um, so in the future, I believe that this will be uh, you know, addressed and that uh, firewall products leveraging the new network extension framework will be able to comprehensively uh, monitor all network traffic and provide that extra layer of, of, of protection. So that's kind of a, an, an interesting case study because it does show that Apple is continually trying to balance usability and security. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you know, those are at odds. Um, and so they kind of swing towards the usability point of view, which then can impact uh, security. But you know, again, I think us as external security researchers, we illustrate these flaws or some of these attacks. Uh, Apple does seem to be somewhat open-minded and take our uh, advice and, and hopefully, uh, you know, address this particular issue. Right. And it kind of ties into a little bit your point earlier about um, the fact that APTs or cyber criminals are using kind of legitimate features that are built in and, um, you know, how that exactly. could potentially be uh, leveraged maliciously. Um, so, um, you know, speaking of Apple's security team, I wanted to ask, um, you know, just in, in terms of their bug bounty program, if you remember sure. a year ago in uh, December 2019, I can't believe it was a year already, um, yeah. they, uh, they launched their public version of their bug bounty program. Um, and would love to kind of hear your thoughts on the program based on your experience and how it's been rolled out the pre past year and what this has meant for kind of Apple's relationship overall with the security community. Yeah, definitely. So I've been a big proponent of bug bounty programs for a long time. I think it's just an extra level of <clears throat> security that companies can kind of opt into where they essentially provide financial motivations for external security researchers to you know, analyze their products and report vulnerabilities and then work closely with them uh, to, per, to, to, to address those. And result is users around the world benefit from it. So I was very happy to see Apple expand their bug bounty program. Originally, it was just iOS invite only. Now it's definitely been expanded in both scope. Uh, it covers macOS as well. And I, I believe it's, it's full, fully public uh, now. Um, you know, I think there's still some room for improvement. Um, you know, I've talked to various researchers that kind of have gone through the bug bounty process. And, you know, there's definitely some, I would say, some rough edges that still need to be addressed. But overall, I think Apple is really doing a great job here. We saw throughout the year some very um, public uh, bug bounty payouts. Uh, you know, I believe there were some researchers who hacked a lot of Apple's external infrastructure and made several hundred thousand dollars. And that's great to see, right? Because first and foremost, Kudos to the security researchers. They are also being financially compensated for essentially what was before free work. But then Apple's taking quick steps to mitigate these risks. Uh, because I always say if security researchers can find these vulnerabilities, hackers, malicious adversaries, three-letter agencies can also as well. So the fact that now there's this comprehensive bug bounty uh, program in place, even if it's not maybe 100% perfect, really positive step in the right direction that, again, will benefit Mac and iOS users around the world. Right. And that's exactly the point, too, is like end users are the ones who, who win that in that situation, too. Exactly. So that's, yeah, yeah. good point. Um, well, I also wanted to ask kind of looking forward going into 2021, um, what do you foresee as some of the biggest trends to look out for in uh, the Mac OS security space, whether it's vulnerabilities or threats or um, sure. just overall? So I spent a lot of time looking at uh, kind of attackers, uh, infection vectors, their, their techniques, the malware to design. Um, so I think we'll see some continued trends. I think adware will continue to be very prolific. Uh, you know, working at Jamf, we build some endpoint security products. Most of the stuff we detect, even on enterprise networks, is, is adware. It's just so prevalent. Users mm -hmm. are just, you know, falling for those fake flash updaters. I do think, as we mentioned, some of the notarization will definitely, uh, you know, maybe put a, a lid on that. But we talked about earlier, uh, AdWare authors are so financially motivated, they then become, as a result, incredibly uh, innovative. So I think we'll just see 
continued prevalence uh, of adware. And I think also we'll see adware authors as well as other malware authors and attackers attempt to leverage Apple technologies or legitimate features or functionalities uh, as a way to gain or maintain access on, on the system. And that's because you know Apple's really locking everything down, so it's very difficult if you don't play by their rules, which is their, their goal. But that means malware authors, for example, if they can get their products notarized, well, it's kind of now they have more trust than they ever did before. Uh, we talked about the iOS store, malicious applications kind of slipping in there. Uh, again, it's really hard to perhaps remotely hack an iOS device, but if you're in the app store and you can coerce users into downloading and running these trusted applications. Well, maybe you don't need any exploits and you can perhaps still do a lot of uh, information gathering users' uh, location and tracking. So I think we'll see trends in that direction where Apple technologies might be used uh, in ways that they weren't originally uh, intended. I think we'll also see Mac being targeted more and more. Um, you know, it's becoming incredibly prolific, especially prevalent in the enterprise. A lot of companies starting to embrace Macs. As kids graduate from college, they love their MacBooks, they want to bring it into the workspace. Apple's really doing a big push into the enterprise. So opportunistic hackers are obviously going to take note of that. And we mentioned, for example, the Lazarus APT group. We saw earlier this year, they took some of their uh, Windows and Linux malware uh, called Dackles and actually ported it over to Mac OS. So to me, that's a really illustrative example of attackers saying, hey, look, there's more Mac targets. Let's take our existing Windows techniques or maybe Windows tools and port them over so we can target these Mac platforms um, as well. So I think that's something that we'll continue to, to see. And then finally, and this is kind of a, a wish, uh, you know, I hope that we uncover more interesting, advanced, sophisticated APT groups. I know they're out there, right? Um, you know, looking in years past, we know, for example, Equation Group, Vault 7 had Mac OS capabilities. Uh, obviously, they probably still do. Uh, we're probably just not seeing them. But, for example, with Big Sur, Apple has introduced a lot of really cool, very powerful frameworks that security products can utilize to likely uh, detect perhaps more advanced uh, APT groups. So in the past, I think the APT groups could perhaps kind of fly under the radar because the security tools weren't maybe as comprehensive as they are on the Windows side. But I really think now that security tools are kind of gaining parity to their Windows counterparts. Uh, and the goal is hopefully we'll uncover some really interesting neat uh, APT groups. Uh, you know, as a malware author, sorry, malware <laughs> analyst, I don't know if it's up there. Uh, <laughs> what I'm going to say. <laughs> uh, you know, it's always, it gets a little boring just looking at adware. Uh, so, you know, when you detect or kind of come across a neat APT uh, type uh, malware, that is really, really intriguing. Like I said, we definitely know it's out there. Uh, so, Hopefully, there's also positive trends in the comprehensiveness of security tools, and we can cover uh, kind of what's probably already out there. Right. And I know, too, as a security reporter, those are, you know, it's always really interesting to kind of uh, look at those types of uh, new threats or really how cyber exactly. criminals are kind of upping the game, because then, you know, defenders can also uh, up their own game and uh, meet them um, to, for the match. So. Um, Patrick, before we wrap up, is there any other kind of threats or, or trends that you want to um, highlight? No, I think we covered things really well. I do want to kind of quick shout out. Uh, I'm actually writing a, a free open source book on the topic of Mac malware analysis. So if you go to taomm.org, which is the art of Mac malware.org, uh, there's a book. So it's kind of the topics we, we talked about here are of interest definitely check it out. And the goal is, we kind of talked about the cat and mouse game, the financial motivations of adversaries. Uh, it's really important that there uh, we can counter that with, uh, you know, well-educated, knowledgeable uh, security researchers and malware analysts. And there's not a lot of literature out there. So the goal is really to build a community-focused resource um, so we can kind of educate and, and, and arm the next generation of, of malware uh, uh, analysts, again, uh, targeting Mac. Mac specifically. Um, so yeah, so, you know, definitely check out the book. Um, and, you know, I think just to kind of wrap everything up, uh, you know, uh, I think, you know, Mac uh, attacks, Mac malware is, isn't going away anytime soon. Um, you know, it's a good field to be in. So uh, definitely keep reading up about this and then, you know, keep an eye on the trends. And I, I think that's the way we can ultimately counter the adversaries and 
as defenders really uh, ensure that uh, our Mac users remain ultimately protected. Right. Well, there's always a lot out there. Um, it's definitely not a quiet space. So, um, That's Patrick, true. Thank you. Good job, security. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, Patrick, thank you so much for coming on to uh, talk a little bit about Mac OS security and really what you're seeing. Thanks, Lizzie. Pleasure to be on. Hope everyone stays safe, has a great holiday season, and uh, let's do this again uh, at the end of uh, 2021. Absolutely. Great. And uh, to all of our viewers, thanks so much for tuning in. Once again, this is Lindsay O'Donnell and Patrick Wordle. And be sure to like and subscribe this video. Thank you. Aloha.